have an online presenter that uh, is uh, uh, Ibrahim from, uh, um, from Somalia. So Ibrahim Mohamed Nur, that is the HMIS specialist from Minister of Health in uh, uh, Somalia. Ibrahim, if uh, you are there, if you can, uh, is not, okay. So let's, okay. So maybe we can jump to the second presenter. Um, is here. That's great. So during this session, we will have uh, three different presentations. The first one, as I was mentioning, uh, it will be done by Ibrahim Ahmad Nur, that is the HMIS specialist uh, in uh, with the uh, Ministry of Health uh, in Somalia. It is going to explain us a little bit their experience uh, about the customization of DHS to tracker and how they um, they switch from uh, an e warn uh, system to the um, to the electronic IDSR. The second presentation, uh, okay. Then for the second presentation, I will say later. Um, Ibrahim, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, can you hear me well? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Yes, uh, my name is Ibrahim Hamanur. Uh, I work for the Minister of Health as the Health Information Management Specialist. So uh, I would like to thank first, before I start my uh, presentation, so I'd like to thank for Oslo University and his presenters who have been invited us and gives us an opportunity to present this presentation. And also I would like to thank for the entire team, the HMI score team for Somalia who have been prepared for or in these papers. So thank you very much. So I will present here on the customization of the DHS2 tracker app uh, to support the implementation of the electronic integrated disease surveillance response in the post E1 system for Somalia. So and the be before I start, so we would like to discuss about uh, how we came up with the development and the use of the DHS2 tracker. So before the DHS2 tracker, Somalia has been using the electronic one alert response network system, which has been used as an emergency case basis. And the number of the priority conditions have been reported uh, a little bit different from the, the unified integrated disease surveillance response. So I will discuss about the use case of the DHS2 tracker app, the transition from the E1 to the, uh, to the IDSR, and what other steps have been taken during the implementation process. And also, it has been uh, developed, also some other paperwork was going on during the, the discussion and the development of the DHS2 tracker. So in the... So next, I can... Yes. So the transition uh, from E1 to the integrated uh, IDSR uh, disease surveillance service, it was a comprehensive set of evidence-based strategy for strengthening the performance of the national disease surveillance system for all priority disease at all levels in the health system. So since 2008, uh, we are using the E1 system. It was only one multiple disease surveillance system, but it has a uh, the challenges in terms of when we are deploying uh, to support the surveillance in the emergent cities, so at uh, the national disease surveillance system, that's not exist for, it is broken down. Sometimes it may uh, not work in the, in, the, in the sustainable way. So the E1 was only being used on the emergency case-based surveillance issues. So such these systems are designated to conduct the surveillance for the few diseases, like uh, 8 to 14 disease. So, and also it was not covered the entire uh, healthy facilities at country level, only for 10 to 15 percentage of healthy facilities have been covered the E1 system. So, and it does not uh, designate to function in, uh, forever. It was only for an emergency. Then uh, how does it work in the IDSR? Uh, uh, we know that the integrated disease surveillance response, it was the evidence from the WHO of our members state has shown into implement and plan it uh, comprehensively. So it has uh, different objectives uh, for the integrated disease surveillance response. For example, it has improved the quality of the surveillance data in terms of completeness, the timeliness and the accuracy. And also it has improved the case detection rate for the outbreaks. So 
the IDSR also has uh, other of monitoring in the disease trends. And also it has up to five times uh, cheaper the implementation of multiple vertical disease surveillance systems because there are, when we are talking about the surveillance, it's not only for one disease, it has a different uh, disease like malaria, AFB, so cholera, all those issues. So in previous uh, E1 system, the country has implemented in the different vertical way disease, but also the Minister of Health has committed to uh, integrate all those different uh, vertical uh, reporting disease into one unified integrated disease surveillance response. So it has been supported and consolidated the data from the multiple source and enabled the surveillance of the data sharing across the multiple sectors and the requirement of the IHR in uh, international health regulations. It has also advanced a One Health program approach uh, on multi-sectoral collaborations in the community engagement surveillance and also in the IDSR, it works in terms of can accelerate the implementation of the IHR core capacities requirement. So what are the steps has been taken during the implementation or coming from uh, uh, verticalizations into one unified integrated disease surveillance response? It has been taken long, but also these are the systemic way process has been taken to the Minister of Health with the help of WHO. It's uh, continuous coordination and sustain the advocacies the baseline assessment of the existing surveillance system, then identification of the country priorities. As I have said in my earlier slide, uh, during the E1 system, we are using only 10, 8 to 14 uh, different diseases. But when we discuss uh, how we can integrate the disease, so the Minister of Health has taken ahead on around 43 priority conditions in order to strengthen the national surveillance and the response system. Uh, it has developed the national technical guideline uh, it has been also developed the training materials uh, to roll out the entire country. Then we conduct uh, the national level TUTIDSR guideline, and it has been cascaded down to the level of the health facility level. So in the continuum of those uh, different steps has been taken, so it has been uh, also trying to monitor the implementation of the IDSR at different level because the idea is that it has, when we develop the tracker, so it has been started, the case-based reporting from the facility level. So these are the national technical guidelines uh, for Somalia, and these are the priority conditions that has been used. So I will go uh, one by one. So in the implementation progress in Somalia, it, it starts in 2016, uh, the joint external evaluation for IHR core capacities, in 2017, also, it has been initiated the draft of the National Action Plan, uh, the plan for expand the E1. So it has been discussed in 2017 whether we can expand the E1 or whether we can shift from other uh, integrated disease or violence response. In 2018, it has been completed the draft plan. 19, it, has on, it has not been conducted anything, but also in 2020, during the COVID-19, also it has started the baseline assessment of the IDSR implementation at country level. Then 2021, also uh, the the multi-stakeholder sensitations uh, in the integrated disease surveillance occurs. The priority conditions has been set. The technical working group has been uh, started. The roadmap of the IDSR also it has been uh, formed in 2021. So in 2022, uh, the development of the guideline and also the IDSR implementation plan has uh, conducted then configuration of the DHIS2 tracker up into this uh, DHIS2, the public health emergency operating center. So uh, establishment of those different factors uh, across during 2020. Then uh, in 2020, the last of 2020, discussions on the development of the tracker up with the support of the Oslo and his Tanzania. Then in 2023, it's the time that we deployed uh, and started the piloting phase of the DHIS2 tracker up at the country level. And it has been uh, IDSR cascade training also had started into the pilot areas. And also later on, it has been scaled up to the wider country level. So what about the use case of the tracker app? What are the benefits compared to the previous uh, E1 system? So during the pilot phase uh, implemented in the DHS2 tracker app, it has been supported the implementation of the ill one in uh, components of the integrated disease surveillance response. Then it was analyzed the data collected from the first month of the pilot phase. 
then the data was captured uh, the individual case basis for the epidemic epidemic brown disease and determined into the performance of the ill one component of the integrated disease surveillance system at the end of the pilot phase i mean we start also uh, evaluate uh, how it has been uh, captured the data at facility level then uh, because when the data has captured at facility level in the case basis, because the priority conditions has the case thresholds, if the case threshold reaches, then they can start uh, uh, booting the Android app, the mobile smartphone they're using at facility level. They, if the threshold has occurs, then they start for reporting in alert. So when the alert came to the system, immediately the public health surveillance team and the facility in charge can cross-check whether this alert has matched the case definitions according to the technical guideline. Then whenever they check, then they look into whether this uh, the true alert or, or, or false alert. So if it's true alert, then immediately they can say true. Then uh, within the facility, so they can request the lab. A request has came up, then the lab specimen has been collected, and then it goes to the either national or, or, or regional uh, labs. So at the end of the pilot phase, it was comprehensive evaluations was conducted to inform the country a wider rollout plan for the use of the DHIS2 tracker applications. Then the later, the success of the pilot first uh, promoted the full scale up of the electronic integrated disease surveillance tracker implementations at the entire country level, the national, state, region, district, and the facility level. So the method we use, uh, we were looking about the, the detected alert epidemic brown conditions have been uh, put into the system because of the key variables that we look into. Then uh, upon the alert detections, the health workers uh, complete uh, immediate submit to the complete form through the Android uh, uh, phones, the enabled the DHS to track and capture up. Then the district public surveillance officers receive the electronic alerts notifications within their email as well as with the system. Then immediately they can verify it, uh, those alerts uh, and they initiate if the alert is true the investigations for true alert, the, the lab service, the SBC man collections. Then the data automatically uh, collated and analyzed, the result displayed on the DHIS2 dashboards. I'm sorry, Ibrahim, if you can uh, wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, around uh, 52 health facilities have started in uh, 17 districts for the, the pilot phase. Then later on, uh, the wider it reaches, almost around uh, 81 uh, percentage for the entire districts. So this is the data flow. When the case come at facility, the either indicator based surveillance, so the case have been identified and registered to the system. And then if it's true alert, then they request the lab. Then the lab team has got the notifications. Then the lab team, the result either negative or positive, then feedback goes again to the facility lab. So in terms of the access apps, so it requires the DHS2 instance, the username and the password. And then it, during the development also, we, 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 we thought about the two forms. One is the case-based surveillance and the other one is the weekly base. So the, the, the weekly aggregate data also is being reported at the facility level. Then the data captures, so I have uh, mentioned it was the case-based register at the facility level. Then the alert, if reached the threshold, the armed, then they put the immediate reporting. Then the lab request issued. Then the SBC man has been collected. Then email notification got the lab and indicates the result has been come out and ready for that. So approximately in April uh, 2023, uh, 15th, the NSC, the DHS tracker app report, it was a challenge, but the 100% of which were resolved within 24 hours with the support of the HISP team. Then uh, 280 alerts were reported during that time. So the all alert has been reported into the different categories, had different conditions, whether the AFP or maybe uh, water acute water diarrhea and the missless case have been reported with that period. Then the completion of the phase one, uh, the electronic uh, integrated disease surveillance response tracker app has rolled out and the coverage right now at country level is almost around 81% of the entire country. So this percent is not the entire facility, but the district base, because we have almost around 120 districts at country level. So almost 81 uh, percentage has been covered for those districts. 
and the discussion was all E1 surveillance system performance indicators were above 80 percentage. Then the, the tracker applications uh, enabled the optimal performance for the E1 component into the IDSR surveillance for this tracker app. So thank you. Uh, these are my conclusions. So any question and answers, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. I'm really sorry to cut you for uh, really for time to allow the other to be able to present. But it's extremely interesting. You can see how it can be very challenging and difficult to implement a world surveillance system in a country. So now I would like to invite uh, uh, Monique Foster, that is the deputy director of programs of CDC programs in um, in Sierra Leone. It uh, has here we have seen all the part about uh, surveillance. Now we can see our first. Um, the more the part of uh, responding to our emergencies. So an outbreak response we're using uh, the 717 uh, approach. So uh, thank you very much. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon. And I want to thank everyone. Um, for having me and the conference organizers, of course, for allowing me to present for my Sierra Leonean colleagues who are unable to attend. Um, this presentation is not very technical um, in regards to DHIS2, but hopefully it will show how DHIS2 is being used to monitor um, and evaluate outbreak response through the 717 framework. We're just sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay. So around 10 years ago, as um, others have mentioned in this session, Sierra Leone was very severely hit by the Ebola outbreak. Over 28,000 cases and 11,000 deaths were reported in the three most hard hit countries. Um, the Sierra Leone Health Service delivery was challenged um, by limited human resources at the start of that outbreak. In both the 2014 Ebola outbreak and 20 um, 20 COVID-19 pandemic show how disease can spread pretty rapidly with devastating impact. We know that responding to public health threats is critical to ensure global health security by quickly and effectively addressing outbreaks at their source. Since the Ebola outbreak, Sierra Leone continues to experience a high burden of public health emergencies. In 2022 alone, the country responded to multiple public health events, including measles, polio, loss of fever, anthrax, COVID-19, and then um, Ebola and Marburg preparations um, because of the outbreaks in our, our neighboring, um, our neighbor's Guinea. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> so Sierra Leone adopted the Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response Framework back in 20, um, 20, 2008. However, this paper-based reporting method was inadequate and plagued by issues of untimeliness, incompleteness, and inaccuracies, what a lot of um, the sessions in this conference have mentioned. It became clear that a more efficient and effective approach was needed, and the CDC worked with the Ministry of Health to implement a nationwide electronic reporting system for notifi notifi notifiable diseases. So we use an EIDSR. The initiative utilized various channels, such as emails, text messages, and phone calls to ensure timely reporting of aggregate data. This was a great improvement, but there were still gaps, particularly the lack of case-based information that would enable an earlier and more effective outbreak response. So in 2019, DHIS2 was customized with our colleagues to create an electronic case-based disease surveillance system. The system is accessible through a web portal and mobile devices, and it empowers surveillance officers in the country to track cases, their contacts, and laboratory requests and results. Since 2021, ECBDS has impl been implemented worldwide, and that's over 1,400 uh, facilities. Um, and since recent outbreaks of loss of fever, measles, and anthrax were swiftly reported, and this was the only system that was used during the COVID-19 pandemic in Sierra Leone. Challenges still persist. There's a shortage of trained surveillance officers to investigate all reported cases, and there's often broken tablets, lack of internet connections, disrupted electricity, and so on. 
Um, but that being said, ECBDS has enhanced data completeness, timeliness, and availability for national level use. And it facilitates what I'm going to talk about today is that um, we can monitor and evaluate responses through the 717 metrics. So Sierra Leone recently introduced event-based surveillance into their system. Um, it's often framed as a non-traditional approach to an early warning system. And uh, 2018, our colleagues in Africa CDC had developed a framework to guide the rollout of EBS in Africa. Um, this is what Sierra Leone used. We revised it in 2022, and we've rolled out this framework in about four of the 16 districts. So how is all this supposed to work? Sorry for the wordiness of the slide. You don't have to read it all. It's just um, shows you kind of how we want the ideal flow of the surveillance system to work, including um, EBS. Ideally, we have people in our EBS units that scan uh, media monitoring, social monitoring, um, or calls. We have a national hotline so people can call in what they suspect is a public health event. Um, so they mon monitor those too. And any potential threats would be detected. An alert would be sent to the EBS unit within the surveillance division. The threat is verified, and then the team would be deployed if it um, meets a threshold. In Sierra Leone, the system is coordinated through DHIS2, where the detection, alert, verification, and um, eventually the event management will be housed. Since everything is in that space, the country is able to track uh, the time to detection, the time to notification, and the time to effective response. So I've got a short video here. Um, 717 is a, um, a, a activity that is led by Resolve to Save Lives, so I thought it best for them to describe it. They've got a great video instead of me plugging through it. So. very short. No one wants another COVID-19 event. The pandemic has provided a now or never opportunity to reset our thinking about epidemic preparedness. Countries and communities must have the capacity to find, stop, prevent epidemics quickly. To do this, we need a clear set of targets to provide an easy to understand and objectively verifiable benchmark to help stakeholders identify areas that need improvement. We propose 717, a timeliness metric that assesses the speed with which a country must detect, notify, and respond to infectious disease threats. It's simple. Seven days to detect and recognize any new suspected outbreak. One day to notify public health authorities and start the initial investigation. And seven days to mount an effective response through seven fundamental actions. 717 emphasizes how the components of the entire health system, from laboratories and surveillance to universal health coverage and leadership, must work together to mount an effective response. By itself, a smoke alarm is not enough to prevent a fire. It needs to trigger action. Similarly, early detection must quickly trigger a chain of notification and action to control outbreaks and save lives. With your partnership in 717, we can make the world safer from the next disease threat. So that's a little bit about 717. And luckily, oh, I don't want to show it to you again. <laughs> yeah. So because we have this electronic surveillance system in Sierra Leone, um, our partners at JAPIGO and the event space surveillance unit were able to retrospectively analyze their surveillance data using um, DHIS2, mainly using the dates of detection, the dates of notification, and the dates of laboratory confirmation, and other information that is required to prove that you're having an effective response. So they looked at outbreaks that occurred between uh, December 2020 and March 2023. Um, 
and then they analyzed those timelines. So there were 16 events and they included anthrax, Zika, chikungunya, loss of fever. There was also um, a tanker fire explosion that required medical countermeasures and a response that way. Um, of the events that were analyzed, 11 were detected within that first seven days. 14 had national teams notified within the one day, and then 10 mounted an effective response within the seven days of notification. So the average time for notification was seven days, so that's great. And then the average time to the notification was one day, but unfortunately, the average time to mount an effective response was a whopping 64 days. And we found that when we looked at the gap analysis, that was really due to the laboratory co confirmation of um, um, the suspected outbreak. So it took a long time to confirm laboratory because a lot of times in Sierra Leone, laboratories have uh, specimens have to be sent out to other laboratories for confirmation for certain diseases. So outbreaks are being detected and reported in a timely manner. Of course, you don't know what you don't know, but of the things that we do know, um, it seems that we're meeting that first seven day goals. We're meeting the, the second one, um, but we really identified uh, gaps in that last seven. And as I said, it's typically done um, due to the laboratory response. Um, this has enabled us to routinely assess our performance and evaluate outbreak response, um, but hopefully we'll move from using the tools retrospectively to real time. So we don't have to wait for the outbreak response to be over to see how it's meeting this, these metrics, especially the last seven. Um, and uh, luckily, because everything is um, organized and housed in DHIS2, that's the mechanism we use there. So with that, I just want to thank all of my colleagues who contributed to this work. Um, Haja Bangora, Sylvester Yonda, Reagan Hartman, Larry Hinkle, um, Dr. Ibrahim Sariki, and Dr. James Squire, who um, would have been here if they could. So I thank you so much. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank you very much for sharing the experience. And I'm calling now on stage uh, Saki Bolasani from uh, Hispo Central Africa. So we have seen a little bit, uh, we are at the end of our journey. We start with uh, surveillance. We see how we can respond to the surveillance. Now we will see an example of a response. So uh, it will uh, uh, it will show, uh, show us a little bit uh, how DHS2 can support during a, um, a vaccination campaign, a, re a reactive vaccination campaign in DRC, and how this can be um, can be supported. It's up. Right, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to see this one. <laughs> okay. 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 Hello, everyone. I uh, hear uh, you can hear me. Uh, so quickly. Uh, I will not talk too much. That is something people are seeing this morning. So I will try to, <laughs> to do the same thing. So quickly, so what, what we are going to share with you is uh, um, the experience of the campaign we made in GRC in, co in collaboration with one of my colleagues who is leading the HISP GRC. But we, as uh, HISP in Central Africa, we help them doing that. So I have this honor to share uh, what happen there. So we will have like uh, an overview uh, on uh, uh, what going, went there, the general objective and uh, why we made uh, this uh, uh, decision of uh, this campaign and then some challenges, but uh, also we will uh, more focus on the dashboard uh, we made there. Yeah. 
So as you know, when we decided uh, to use the ashes to to um, uh, collect the data of a battery campaign, it is mostly because of we want to digitize in um, what it was going in past when people are just collecting data by Excel or by uh, uh, just by paper. So that means uh, first first of all to be capable to make enumeration with uh, the platform you wanted to use but also the planning and the when it is will come to distributions to use the same platform and uh, also to better doing uh, the payments of the people who are going to work there how to follow up of the supply chain and uh, you know first of all um, the training uh, as well so for that we were capable to use the access to do that mostly for the enumerations the distribution, the payment was done by another applications and also the supervision. So we use the access to, to do that. And what is important is uh, to be capable that if we are using a new platform, the Ministry of Health can take care of that and to use it for the next year. No. So using the access to it is good because the Ministry of Health, uh, the HMS itself, it is already on the DHS. So, so if you are using the access to as campaign things platform, so uh, you are sure that uh, the Minister of Health itself can take care of that. Yeah. So, in GRC, what happened there is that uh, for the polio campaign, we were focused into one province. And for this province, we have like two areas. Uh, it is like uh, two departments. One of, uh, one of them was uh, called the Camina. Which one it is most above like uh, rural and uh, urban areas. When the Kabundo gender one was only the rural area locations. So we wanted to improve this kind of uh, campaign to see um, if uh, we can use the DSS to, to, to better manage this campaign. So the campaign activity itself was managed by the DSS too when the help desk uh, and uh, some kind of activities was made by OGK and another tools uh, designed by the uh, WHO itself, which one allowed to track teams uh, itinerary during the campaign. So this work, uh, this campaign was a collaboration or uh, a partnership between the CHAI, his Western Africa, and also EMI Wolf, who, who helped uh, uh, the API program to manage this campaign. But what we did after make the configuration is uh, to test, first of all, this, what we made with the DHS2 in real life. We went there like uh, just uh, a couple of days to test if everything is working well and uh, to, like, uh, to get feedback from users. So we know that we can improve it before the campaign itself uh, to start it. Uh, so um, we were able to make uh, the enumerations. As you can see, uh, that is uh, like uh, a dashboard relating to enumeration. And um, this enumeration was uh, focused on the household, not only, but also the children living in, so because the polio campaign will be related to the children itself. But for some, some reasons, we have some challenges where we were doing this enumeration of our household because uh, sometimes the people are not at home and so forth. Okay. But also we realized when we are doing this enumeration, since before starting the enumeration, you have sometimes a, an extrapolation of the population because you have the population of the country, you can make some coefficient and you know, yeah, for this area, we can now see this kind of uh, household. But during the enumeration itself, uh, we find that is not really much like uh, the same things. So for say, some areas we can have beyond 100% and some areas you have uh, a lower 100%. That means that sometimes that our extrapolation also coefficients to be, must to be um, changed sometimes. So the other one was the dashboard for the enumeration. And then during the campaign itself, the vaccination also, we have another dashboard to do that. As you can see here, we realized that uh, during the vaccination, we have also more than 100% of uh, the children vaccinated. That means maybe the enumeration itself 
was not uh, fully done. Uh, maybe uh, when we were doing like enumerations, children weren't at the, the, the same place. And during the, the vaccination itself, we found them. So with the dashboard like this, we can also automatically find that. But what was nice is that um, the child also requested to have like uh, a specific dashboard, not what we are doing with for the HS, but they wanted like a custom dashboard to better follow what went there. So one minute, maybe I can just show you that. Uh, yeah. So here is uh, the current dashboard we have into the DHS2. As you can see here, you have the enumeration, the vaccination, the monitoring, the supervision. So all these steps uh, of the campaign was uh, represented by uh, a dashboard into the DHS2. But uh, with the powerful of the DHS, that means we can customize additional apps uh, regarding the, um, the client needs, if I can say that we were able to add another dashboard here, which come to the layout, the country needed. Yeah. As you can see here, and the goal of uh, this plat platform of uh, GRC was to be able to keep care of uh, all the campaign we will be uh, dying to the countries. The first one for one was the polio, but uh, during this year, they are going to do malaria one, and uh, maybe we can represent it by the same dashboard because of, uh, yeah, you can just come here and just select your vaccine. If it is like Milda, if it is like meningitis or something like that, and automatically everything will can be here automatically. Maybe this one is in French. Uh, I can just do like, uh, yeah, like this, and you can see it. Uh, so you can see the targets, the reporting rates, how many village you got, and so forth. You can automatically see the, the percentage here. The performance also as well can be shown. Children between zero and uh, 15, uh, under 16, yeah, <laughs> six months, you can see them automatically, you can see the rates. And uh, also these kind of uh, um, charts is with the way for legends. So if you are under 50%, you can see like red and so forth. So it is like we want to redesign with icons, the way the dashboard is represented also. And also during this campaign, we decided also to check some kind of uh, disease surveillance for the other diseases. This one has represented like this. And uh, for our cases, we are managing the stocks. So you can know how many stocks were distributed and so forth. The coverage as well can be shown here based on the period you made the campaign. You can just keep the period like uh, between, instead of coming and say January, February, you can just select a period when you made your campaign starting date and end date. Okay, and then based on that, you can automatically see day by day what is going on on your dashboard. Yeah. Until the staff check in, the monitoring, everything, all, all of that can come. And if you don't want the black, the dark mode, you can just come and switch and to go on the white mode like the other one and something like that. So it is just to show that with the DHS2 and the flexibility of the DHS2 as well, you can better yeah, so represent your things inside of the DHS2, not over the, uh, all the time, so outside of the DHS2 or something like this. Yeah. So that is uh, um, a short way to show you what we made for the dashboard itself. So we know that uh, for each activities, we have some challenges. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, most of times the common challenges. Uh, wait, yeah, maybe I should uh, show. <laughs> so one of challenges we had is mostly sometimes the lack of precision of uh, uh, the version of Android phone we use. If we want to collect a GPS code 
like the coordinates, sometimes there is a lack of precision. That was something, but I know that the team of uh, Android team are working on it to better manage, uh, improve this kind of uh, uh, issue. Yeah. I think that is uh, something I wanted to share with you. And I know that uh, mostly uh, the coordination will be something we need to improve. But uh, the goal of uh, the DRC campaign things is to have just one platform, one instance, and to keep all the campaign which the county will have to do in future on the same place. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sakibo. I'm really sorry because we are already over time. So we cannot have, have any Q&A, but it was very interesting to see how DHS2 can support the different, all the different stages, all the different steps of from starting from the surveillance, triggering uh, outbreak uh, and a response of uh, of that. So of course, if you have any question, please you can uh, you can reach the people that did the presentation. And if not, uh, of course, always through the community of practice. Thank you very much.